a privilege to welcome everyone here to Data and Society and to Data Bytes, which is our weekly um, discussion series where we invite thought leaders to engage with us on topics that are important uh, to our community. My name is Mark Latinero. I'm a fellow here at Data and Society, and I also lead the Data and Human Rights program um, here as well. And I am beyond excited to be uh, moderating this week's Data Byte that explores the dynamics and ethics of data visualization. Now, the genesis of this, this Data Byte and this talk is a, um, a smaller forum that we're having tomorrow, which is co-hosted by Data and Society, The Engine Room, and ThoughtWorks. Um, and that was sort of inspired by a realization that data visualization has become the de facto sort of language of big data, particularly as it's communicated to non-experts, um, from sort of high-level policymakers who might not understand the mechanics of big data but want to sort of know what it's about um, immediately, to the general public. So now we're in the situation where we have sort of journalists, advocates, and researchers sort of armed with the tools of data visualization. And they're using those tools to create you know, what we've seen, like heat maps, um, infographics, um, and other types of visualizations to inform, persuade, and even make decisions. But what's rarely discussed are the ethics and responsibilities that surround data visualization. And when data viz is offered to convey the hidden story or the big picture, what is missing? What biases remain? How can we actively engage when visualization of quantitative information is presented to us as fact? And lastly, what are our sort of interpretive or cognitive limitations when it comes to um, perceiving data visualization? And so with that, it's a treat and a privilege to have Catherine D'Ignazio and Mushan Zaraviv here to help us think through some of these issues together. Now, Catherine is a professor at Emerson College and also a research affiliate at the MIT um, Center for Civic Media. And she wrote this fantastic piece called What Would Feminist Data Visualization Look Like, which I encourage everyone here um, to read if you haven't already. Um, and Mushan is a designer and educator and activist based in Tel Aviv. He, um, some recent work is Disinformation Visualization, How to Lie with Data Viz. Um, which I encourage you to, to see the video um, online, and also a piece that he wrote for um, our forum tomorrow called Data Viz, The Unempathetic Art. Um, so for today, you know, we've designed today really to be um, participatory and provocative as well. And so we're going to have um, relatively short presentations by um, Mushan and Catherine, followed by some moderated discussion and then some open Q&A. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm uh, after learning more about you. I'm uh, a bit more intimidated, but uh, but I think it will be fine. Um, so I'm going to talk about the big picture. Um, the th this this was um, I first presented this in a conference in Berlin uh, called the Technosphere Now. Uh, trying to uh, on a panel looking at data and the role of of uh, data in in kind of pictures of of uh, of the world as uh, and soci society and technology as devel developing together something that um, I have s quite a few problems with um, so uh, the following is going to be some kind of a data collage uh, cut up uh, a somewhat frantic attempt to gather data and find patterns um, to reveal the big picture so first um, it's going to be in three acts uh, act one distance act two language and then act three ambiguity um, first i have to confess i am biased um, maybe you know that about me, maybe you read it in my bio, um, or you can identify it in my accent. I am human. Um, I am also a humanist, uh, though I know this is no longer considered uh, as cool as it used to be. Uh, and yes, I still value politics, uh, which is even less cool uh, today. So first, distance. We will le leave the atmosphere to discuss the technosphere. Um, Apollo 17 was uh, the last mission to the moon, launched on December 7, 1972. <laughs> Roger, 
So as it was, it was starting to its journey leaving the atmosphere, um, six hours after, after liftoff, Apollo was positioned in perfect zenith uh, between the Earth and the Sun. Astronaut uh, Jack Schmidt pro pointed his uh, camera back towards the Earth and took this picture. This is the blue marble, uh, the first photographic proof that the world is indeed round. Um, one of the most widely distributed uh, photographs in history, um, you might have had it on your fa first iPhone. Um, you've probably seen it before, but is that w the way you remember it? Uh, what's wrong with this picture? Well, so the South Up map or a South Up uh, blue marble would have freaked everybody out. Um, NASA had to flip the image bef before distributing it to, to make sure it complies with, it, with our expectation, uh, expectations rooted in hundreds of years of uh, cartographic standardization. I'm not arguing a South Up map is right or wrong, um, but I am arguing our terrestrial need to frame a floating globe in these terms is meaningful. Um, as NASA's intervention tells us something important about the relationship between reality, the way we re record it, and the way we use it to see the big picture. For thousands of years, uh, we, we were poetically too close to the surface to actually know where we are. Um, ships crossing the ocean co couldn't tell how fast they, they're moving or, or if they're moving at all. They developed the technology, the log, um, an actual piece of log of wood, uh, it, would use to it was used to, to create a distance between the static point or datum on Earth and the moving boat. Uh, the knotted rope, the, the log line, would stretch to, to reveal how fast the boat was going. Until today, sea speed is measured in units called knots. Um, it wasn't very accurate, but it was useful enough in figuring out the speed of the boat. Uh, one year after the Blue Marble, the U.S. satellite-based Global Positioning System project started. The first satellite was launched in 78, and the system became fully operational in 95 and commercial in 2000. A again, um, the technosphere needed to distance itself from the atmosphere to accurately log terrestrial datum. Still, GPS is I inaccurate. Looking into Google's logs, um, we can see how they try to accurately describe the data's inaccuracy and to poetically measure and quantify levels of confidence. Act two, language. What about the language we use to log all of these data? Um, half a century before we started challenging the physical boundaries of our world with space travel, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein wrote, the limits of my language means the limits of my world. If we can't expand the limits of our language, how can we expand the limits of our world? But, but as William Burroughs suggested, language, uh, language is a virus from outer space. Um, maybe language is external to us. Maybe it's even extraterrestrial. Um, maybe we humans could develop a language beyond our human languages and the brain beyond our human brains. Alan Turing pondered, can machines think? He suggested using binary language, mathematical truth, as, ma as a mathematical tr truth, as a possible better foundation than human language, and a computer to process and speak that language. Because if language can be external to us, it would mean that we are not alone. Not alone in the universe, and we're not the only intelligent beings in the technosphere. Let me address this ambiguity. Zeros and ones answer a simple question. Yes, no, black, white, zero, one. Um, it is not very useful to, to us, but it can scale to more complex questions like what, where, when, questions of information. Um, why and how becomes a bit harder, questions of knowledge. Um, and, and then what, what, what next? Where, we, where we can we get from here? Questions of wisdom, of decision, of policy become even more complicated. 
uh, they require uh, deliberation, and it makes uh, such, uh, such, such uh, decisions um, hard for us as individuals. They are even hard on a society level as, pu as public policy. So, so different thinkers try to simplify them in different ways. To simplify things, Margar Margaret uh, Thatcher th famously argued that there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. That's easier. Um, Ayn Rand would suggest we can simply, simply focus on individuals. Um, she also argued we should leave the, these questions for the markets to solve. Norbert Wiener developed a networked approach of addressing these hard questions through inputs and outputs and feedback loops, retracting back from the hum human language of, uh, to his cybernetics, a system theory with basic uh, rules like zeros and ones. Kevin Kelly would suggest we focus on information. Whether it, whether it be DNA, zeros and ones, or what have you, it is all information. Kelly used to talk uh, of a technosphere, but more lately he's been using the term technium. Ray Kurzweil argues, um, information defines your personality, your memories, your skills. He, he, advocate, he advocates the near, the near future of the technosphere in the singularity. Speaking of language, Google recently renamed their the version to the, to the technosphere alphabet. They've hired Kurzweil as their chief futurist, and, uh, and Google's famous mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. If we consider it in the light of Kurzweil and Kelly, we can better understand why they're investing in self-driving cars, robots, and biotechnology. Okay. And why they've teamed with Kurzweil and NASA to, to found the Singularity University as a training center for corporate uh, executives and governments, government officials. Um, in his provocative book, Ke Kelly, Kelly tries to examine what would uh, technology want. And he suggests uh, quite a few uh, things that technology might want. It wants a lot of things from us. Um, but I kind of I feel like something is missing. What about profit? It seems like technology wants profit along the same trajectory. Or is it what technology wants? Maybe it's what capitalism wants? Um, in the line of Kurzweil's affinity for exponential growth, Larry Ser and Sergey would ask uh, to please add, can you please add speed? Uh, the way it dominates the digital uh, arms race, uh, it seems like speed might be the currency of the technosphere. Um, um, yeah, and uh, Google's uh, speed test interface asks, why are these numbers important to me? B well, the reason these numbers are important to me is because, because speed as a value negates political deliberation and civic engagement which does not comply with what Kelly argues technology wants. Uh, shouldn't we be asking what democracy wants? I chose th these thinkers not for their intellectual rigor, but for, for their unquestionable influence on politics, culture, and technology. Through their thoughts, uh, th theories, technology holds a bigger truth. Whether it be markets or packet switching, there is no room for politics there. We shouldn't interfere, while they, speaking in technology's name, influence and disrupt it quite substantially. Uh, they are the techno-determinists. They, they, inform, they informed and represented a specific intellectual perspective, um, or even techno-libertarianism, a, a very specific political worldview that calls for the neutralization, depolitization of technology and markets. In the name of a, of a scientifically objective truth between reality and data, it assumes a stable, unambiguous, and scientifically objective understanding of the world. We perceive rea and, and let's try to think about it uh, for a second. If we think of reality, uh, we perceive reality first and foremost visually. 
and then uh, we encode our, uh, our recording of reality through data, um, through language. Um, th then by thinking of technological la languages as external to us, uh, we could think of this um, as, we, we imagine a clear, objective, and apolitical line between reality and data. Our machines process this, this data in a fast and efficient way. Uh, but, to, but when we need to see the big picture, we have to represent it um, mainly through, through the graphic. Usually visually using graphics, uh, which, which, mu which much like reality is um, mainly perceived visually. But much like data, it is the product of man-made language. Um, and that, um, th th this graphic is, is useless for machines and is far from reality. This distance be becomes a problem. Um, so we try to depoliticize the graphic representation in a rush towards this imaginary objective line. The, the, this is what computer science and Wikipedia calls disambiguation. A reduction not, not only of the image, but of knowledge and society. At the, at, the, at the large uh, at, um, society and culture, at large society at large, uh, t towards what can be more easily processed beyond the beyond the limits of our uh, of our limited uh, human lingual worlds. It gives us clear understanding, sim simpler collaboration, a common ground, so so we can also also fit nicely within the big picture that is sped back to us. The price, of course, is uh, reduction, depolitization, and determinism. It is the current uh, prevailing vision of the technosphere, wi which I believe we need to distinguish ourselves from. I it sure is easier to think of individuals of inputs and outputs of zeros and ones, but isn't this simply lazy? In Borges's aptly titled uh, On Exactitude in Science, cartographers set up a map of the empire which had, has the, the size of the empire itself. Today, this is the myth of big data, that, that it is the documentation, representation, and simulation of reality at large, so much so that we ourselves are but signs on the, of the map. Subjected to its index, that, that map has finally abandoned and, and forgotten. I, uh, I, on the other hand, um, don't think data and its rep representation are useless and ought to be abandoned. But I still think, b like Borges, that this map of the exactitude of science is a myth. Neither data nor its representation neatly document, represent, or replace reality, but they can still be useful. Rather than disambiguate culture, we should call for reambiguation of society, of technology, of the technosphere. Uh, to conclude, rather than Im imagining a, sim a seamless representation of the, wall of the world, I suggest we, we should acknowledge and represent our understanding of the world as sinful. We're probably not on the top or bottom, we may be both, or even, even that may change. We should consider how our distance or lack thereof affects our, our judgment. We should acknowledge the limits of our, la of our languages, whether binary or other, and we should embrace ambiguity and appreciate its emancipatory qualities. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm super pleased to be here. Thank you to Mushan uh, for a great presentation. Thank you to Mark. Thank you to Data and Society for hosting. Um, so I am going to talk about the subject of a recent blog post that I made that you all may have read. But if you haven't read it, here's the abbreviated version. You don't have to read it now. <laughs> so, um, all right. The, the, the general topic is thinking of this kind of uh, speculative, exploratory thing of what would feminist data visualization look like. Uh, so this is me. Uh, I'm a professor of data visualization and civic media at Amherst College, which is, uh, and I teach in the journalism department. So I'm mainly teaching journalism students right now how to work with data. Um, very novice students, um, and that is actually f that teaching work has actually informed a lot of this thinking. Um, so, sort of, what's the what is the issue? Um, so one thing that we can probably all agree on is that data visualizations are becoming more mainstream, more ubiquitous, 
um, more accessible to people outside of um, somewhat more elite or scientific circles, used as like a scientific tool, and more into uh, mainstream places like journalism. And you can, you can see this just in the growth of the practice of data journalism over the past five to 10 years. The tools to create those visualizations are also proliferating at a kind of crazy rate right now. Uh, my colleagues Rahul Bhargava and Dahlia Othman and myself have counted more than 500 new open free tools for working with data in various ways and doing data storytelling. But one of the issues, even with this kind of uh, crazy sort of proliferation of both tools and examples, is that our efforts at data literacy and cultivating data literacy have not caught up. Um, and so this is like a whole other area of my research. I'm involved in a bunch of different data literacy projects because I think this is a, is a hugely important area to be thinking about. Um, we are particularly not caught up in data literacy in what you might call the accountability industries. Um, and so by those, I mean spaces like journalism, law, education, and the arts. Um, and those are the, the, the fields which traditionally have a public-facing orientation and a tradition of this idea of sort of holding power to account, that kind of classic, um, that classic mission. We're also missing really huge swaths of the population in that most of the people that work with data are male and are white. So the problem is that data visualizations, particularly for those people who don't yet speak data, um, they wield a tremendous amount of rhetorical power. Um, and I see this in my students every day. Uh, when you see a chart and you kind of just shut down because you just say, okay, that, that, whoever made that is an expert um, because I can't do that. So even when we rationally know that data visualizations don't represent the whole world, the whole picture, we forget that fact and we accept charts as these facts because they're generalized, they're scientific, they're quantitative, and they seem to present an expert and neutral point of view. Um, so what accounts for that power? What accounts for that rhetorical power that, that uh, visualizations and maps have? Um, and so here we can look to critical cartography, the, the kind of a special sub-discipline of cartography and geography in academia. But for 40 years, critical cartographers have been saying that maps are sites of power. Um, maps produce worlds that are intimately bound up with that power. So they don't just represent the world. They don't just, are not just like representing the facts, right? Um, they produce facts as well. Um, and we can also look here, in terms of explaining this rhetorical power, we can look to feminist science. Um, I, was, I was remarking, we have like some of the same images. Um, so from a feminist science perspective, and I'm particularly drawing on Donna Haraway, she would call this rhetorical power the god trick. Um, so this idea that there's something sort of dizzying and seductive about seeing everything, seeing it all at once, um, seeing the whole world from this perspective of no body, or from this perspective that few bodies have actually sort of concretely enjoyed, right? And so here, I'm just going to read, I put this in the blog post, and I'm just going to come back to this quote because it's, it's a piece of performance art. Um, so it's a, an extended excerpt, but just bear with me. So this is an excerpt uh, from this essay, Situated Knowledges, the Science Question in Feminism and the Privilege of Partial Perspective. Uh, so this is Donna Haraway, and it's all about vision. So the eyes have been used to signify a perverse capacity, honed to perfection in the history of science, tied to militarism, capitalism, colonialism, and male supremacy, to distance the knowing subject from everybody and everything in the interests of unfettered power. The instruments of visualization in multinationalist, postmodernist culture have compounded these meanings of disembodiment. The visualizing technologies are without apparent limit. The eye of any ordinary primate like us can be endlessly enhanced by sonography systems, magnetic resonance imaging, artificial intelligence-linked graphic manipulation systems, scanning electron microscopes, computed tomography scanners, color enhancement techniques, satellite surveillance systems, home and office video display terminals, cameras, 
for every purpose, from filming the mucous membrane lining the gut cavity of a marine worm living in the vent gases on a fault between continental plates, to mapping a planetary hemisphere elsewhere in the solar system. Vision in this technological feast becomes unregulated gluttony. All seems not just mythically about the god trick of seeing everything from nowhere, but to have put the myth into ordinary practice. And like the god trick, this eye fucks the world to make techno monsters. Just gonna like stop for a second there. <laughs> So what do we say? So the God trick. So the God trick is the trick. That is the trick of pretty much all of visualization that we're talking about. It's the trick of maps. It's the trick of the, uh, the, the pictures of the whole world. It is the gaze at the world from the position of no body, the, the position that no actual physical body occupies. Uh, it's disembodied. But the thing is that feminist standpoint theory would say that all knowledge is socially situated, that all knowledge does in fact come from bodies, right? Um, and in this case, when we talk about what is the, the view from no body, it actually is a view from a body, though that view is the, 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 the view from the white male body. Um, and so there's this other, I won't read this whole thing, but the disembodied view signifies the unmarked positions of man and white that those are the defaults. That is natural, that is neutral. Um, okay, so, but the idea here in this project is not to do what a lot of academics, I feel like, do all the time, which is like you go around and being like, bad over there, and bad over there, uh, oppression over there, oppression over there, oppression over there, um, or you kind of sit around and critique things. Um, the, the idea here is to think about how we can adopt what the scholar Shaowen Barzell calls a generative position. Um, and so that's a position in which you actually try to fix the things that are broken. <laughs> so. Um, and so one of the questions that I've been thinking about in this regard, in relation to this problem, is how do we outline a feminist ethics for data visualization? What would that look like? And so I think we can start, I mean, we could start in many places, but I, I will just lay out a starting point. And let's say we start with this as a statement of feminist ethics. Um, and so what do we mean? So feminist objectivity, this is again a quote from Haraway, feminist objectivity means quite simply situated knowledge. What is situated knowledge? Situated knowledge means the view from a body, a thing that is a body, like we're here, we're in the bodies. Um, and it also means the inclusion of more and different and varied bodies and the production uh, of those knowledges. Um, and so I want to note here that I just mentioned her name, but I've been really inspired and thinking really deeply about the work of Shaowen Barzell, who's from the field of human-computer interaction. Um, and she has, this is a really seminal piece, in, in my opinion, um, which outlines a feminist design agenda for that field. And, and that's it's something I'm borrowing from here, and the, the borrowing even just from this intent of like, how do we take a feminist ethics and then operationalize it, put it into strategies, create design principles, um, and then experiment with embodying those things. Um, so how do we operationalize it? How do we translate situated knowledge into design strategies? I've come up with three. I think there's probably a bunch more that we could invent, um, but let's, let's start with three. Um, and so I'm just gonna go through these and give a couple of examples one by one. Um, and I wanna say that I think what this means, what like feminist data visualization would mean, would mean changes in the process of creating data visualization. It would mean changes in the form that data visualization takes, so the actual visualization strategies, the visual part, the representation, and it would mean changes to the content. Um, what, what, is, what is the content? Um, okay, so uh, inventing new ways to represent uncertainty, outsides, missing data, flawed methods. So why? Data visualizations are great at pre presenting these wholly contained, reduced, and perfect worlds. Um, what they're not so great at representing is what they don't know about. 
the places that the data doesn't go, what has fallen outside the realm of analysis and consideration because it was just too thorny and complicated to deal with. Um, so the idea here is how do we represent what is missing in some sense? Um, and I love this piece. It's probably hard for people to see it entirely, but this is a conceptual art piece from 1967, but it's a map. It's called The Map to Not Indicate. Um, and here on the map is Iowa and Kentucky, and those are the only things on the map. And then down here, it tells you what is not on the map. So what, what is not indicated on the map is Canada, James Bay, Ontario, Quebec, St. Lawrence River, uh, Lake Michigan is not there, Arkansas and Indiana, the Bahamas, the Andros Islands, the Straits of Florida. You can imagine this would go on for a long time. Um, but we, they're telling us what is missing. So can we ask of our data that it point to its own outsides, right? to the systemic biases and pervasive oppression that exist in the world that even produced the spreadsheet. Um, and sometimes like the visual method for this might be really simple. It might be as simple as creating a legend entry for the people that aren't there, right? So something here, so where are the female presidents? It's all, it's all gray, right. Um, and then sometimes this also mean, might mean visual strategies for communicating imprecision and for communicating uncertainty. Um, so this, is, for example, is the work of Trevor Paglin, um, who uh, in the mid-2000s was going around and trying to systematically document the sites where the CIA was abducting and kidnapping people. Um, which are hard to access, of course, because those are um, government sites and they're often black sites in foreign countries. And so he would get as close as he could to where these planes were taking off and landing, and then he would deploy an astronomical, like a telescopic camera to then even get a little bit closer. But still, he couldn't get a clear picture. And so the blurriness communicates that in this, like, this very specific way. It communicates that this subject remains outside of our grasp. It, our knowledge of it is partial. Okay, so secondly, what else could we do? We might think about how do we bring back the bodies? How do we shift that perspective from having no body um, to having some bodies? So how could we invent new ways to reference the material economy that's behind the data? Um, this might mean the, pro the bodies that produced the visualization, so the process, the bodies that collected the data. It might mean the bodies that are the subjects of the data. Um, so this, for example, is a kind of lovely way, I think, of just visually illustrating this idea. So I'm part of a group called Public Lab, a citizen science group. Public Lab has a technique for doing balloon mapping, where you can capture very high resolution aerial imagery by just um, hanging a digital camera from a balloon or a kite. And what's lovely about this method is that what it often does, the people doing the mapping are here. They're present in the image. Their bodies are there. And in this image in particular, you actually see that line linking the balloon, the technology capturing it to the bodies on the ground that are doing that thing. Um, so the data that flows into spreadsheets and um, databases is often eerily disconnected from these material practices. And so how do we reconnect those things and re-represent those things in the end product? This also might mean creative strategies uh, to invent new and very deliberately artificial bodies that, that talk about their data or that visualize their data. Um, so this is a project that I've been working on more of like a kind of art and STEM education project. Um, this talking flower sculpture sits in a creek. Uh, it collects water data using water quality sensors, and then it proceeds to tell really bad jokes about that data in a robot voice. <laughs> Um, but so this clear artificiality of the speaker de-neutralizes and denaturalizes the data. It gives it a speaking position. But it doesn't mean that we all have to do art projects. Um, so this idea of uh, data provenance or data lineage um, is increasingly a subfield of big data and big data analysis. So you can think about this as a kind of a supply chain management for data so you can trace how it flows through a system. Um, at the moment, it's very technically focused. So there are like actual companies that do this for you. And they'll show you, like, first we got the data from these spreadsheets. Then we combined it over here. And then we did these outputs with it. Um, but you could imagine a much more socio-technical, um, much more integrated way of depicting the process of the way that data flows through a system, where it comes from, who does what to it, why they do that, and, and how it gets represented in the output. So collecting much more robust meta data about the stages, that would be a way to bring back the bodies, too. Um, okay, and so finally, um, 
The third and final thing is this idea of how do we make dissent possible? And like the, the sort of converse of this is how do we just make participation possible? It's, it's like a kind of almost more basic question. Um, what, I, what, what, what might that mean? Um, so this might mean things, devise ways of talking back to the data. So not being presented with a perfect world with a couple of buttons to click or whatever and going ooh and ah, but how do we talk back? How do we question the facts to present alternative views and realities, to contest and undermine even just like why do we do this thing? Why has this topic been chosen in the first place? Um, and that doesn't mean just after the fact, in my opinion. This is where like, I think the shift in process really comes. Um, although that might be interesting to experiment with, like the platform uh, Many Eyes, which is now unfortunately defunct, had, I think, a really interesting feature, which was you could talk. There was a conversation feature about data visualizations. Um, although that has, that has now gone away. But I think it was before it was time. Um, but so how can we think about even just earlier in the process, so not just about the end product, right? Um, and because this is where the kind of pervasive whiteness and maleness of data comes most to the forefront. If data work were less male and, what, and less white, what would data visualization look like? Um, and so here I, I'm pulling a couple examples from projects I think are super interesting in this area of um, thinking about more participatory data uh, structures. Uh, this is work by my colleague Rahul and Emily Bargava, and they call this data therapy. Um, but they actually work with nonprofit and community organizations uh, to help them look at their data, teach them how to work with data. And then the output is often in the form of what they call a data mural. Um, and so it's a kind of data visualization, but it's a really different than like a bar chart or something like that. Um, and it has a different kind of relevance to the community that created it. Um, another, I think, really awesome project that I've been following from afar is the RAP Research Lab uh, by Tahir Hempel, um, where he manages their media arts education program and uses hip hop to teach data visualization and data mining and design. Um, and then finally and lastly, uh, broadening, making dissent possible and broadening participation also might mean creating visualizations that purposefully and intentionally have a point of view. They're not purportedly neutral and natural, um, but because they speak from the perspective of bodies that have been systematically excluded and oppressed. Um, and so this is, I think, a, a really incredible example of this. This is um, way back when, this is 1971 in Detroit. Um, there was this um, kind of fascinating project called the Detroit Geographic Ex Expedition and Institute, which involved a lot of uh, white male cartographers, uh, very sort of elite, and, and um, urban black youth in particular led by this high school dropout named Gwendolyn Warren. Um, and they have formed this uh, fragile, unstable, and ultimately sort of explosive partnership <laughs> um, and produced three uh, field reports from this. Um, but these were maps produced um, with a purpose. And so the purpose of this map was to advocate for the idea of black planning. Um, because so here what was happening is this points downtown track. So suburban uh, white commuters were coming in from the suburbs, coming to work in Detroit, and just disobeying all of the uh, traffic signals and actually um, killing children. Um, so very explicit sort of point of view. Okay, so um, I will leave you by just repeating this call for this feminist ethics of data visualization. So feminist objectivity means quite simply situated knowledge. And what do we mean by situated knowledge? We mean the view from a body and the inclusion of more and different and varied bodies and from the um, entire data pipeline. So from inception to collection to analysis to visualization. Uh, so thank you very much. Th thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Catherine. Um, and I think uh, I'm gonna kick this off, um, this discussion um, Q&A period with Mimi um, to, her work is on um, data visualization and particularly what's missing in data viz. Um, how would you sort of react? Well, first off, thank you. Thanks for coming and talking to us. That was great. Um, I really appreciated a lot of the things that you were saying, and I kind of wanted to um, push back a little bit just for fun. Um, <laughs> so 
one thing that you mentioned, which I feel one of the things that you're bringing up is that a lot of the visualizations that we see don't come, and maps as well, they don't come with metadata. They don't, there's, there's no way to talk about the fact that it's an interpretive act as much as it is a technical one. Mm -hmm. And that's not encoded in it. And part of the problem I've seen when working with people around visualization is that even when you provide some of that stuff um, at the bottom, people won't look at it. People yeah. won't read it. So that's one thing is what do we do when the very, like the act, it's the act itself that is the problem. How do you account for the fact that the, the things that we might provide to try to like trouble that, um, the fact that it's not situated are easy to avoid and might not even help us address the problem. Another thing is um, tied to the last image that you showed from the Detroit Geographic Expedition, which was really great and really powerful. But I think a lot of, you could argue that a lot of the power of that comes from the fact um, that they are troubling this sort of invisible white male gaze that, like this veneer of objectivity. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we're not actually moving away from the subjective perspective, we're just playing around with it. So we're still responding to it. Is, do you think that there's a way that we can actually step outside of that so that it's not just a response, that we're actually coming from this point of view that is completely just apart from it? Hmm. Um, great, okay, great questions. Okay, so I'll start with the first question. Um, I, yeah, I totally agree, and I, I guess I would say I think there are emerging practices, for example, in journalism, it's becoming more and more the standard that when you do a data-driven story, um, you have a, um, a discussion of your methods in some sense, and you often, often journalists are actually publishing their data sets, so there's, there are these... Um, gestures towards being much more transparent and open about how you arrived at these kinds of conclusions um, and so on and so forth. And so I think, and like where you got the data, you know, and, and what are the limitations of the data? So that's often discussed in the methods post. Some, it depends on the format. Often those are separate from the visualization or they might be like beneath in some way um, because they're presumed to not be of interest to, you know, the broader public. And in fact, I don't have data on this, but like anecdotally, I could say that probably very few people actually click on those things, <laughs> right? So, um, so in a sense, like you're sort of telling people, hey, this is not complete, this is not neutral. Here are the limitations of it, but you're not representing that. And and, and I think that's that's one of the. I feel like we can do better. Those practices are good, but I think that we can do better at incorporating that into the visual form itself. And the same could be said for um, metadata. I think people are increasingly understanding the need to provide data dictionaries that accompany data sets that give some of the human context for what these things mean in situ um, and why they were collected and how they're used in, say, internal processes within the city or something like that. Um, and so when you can get a data dictionary, it's a super helpful thing. Um, but yet again, it's sort of like, how do you, again, bringing back the bodies. I, th I just think like we're kind of headed in a good direction with those practices, but how do we um, put them into the visualization itself and represent those things themselves? Um, and then your second question is really interesting, and I'm not sure I have an answer for it. Uh, the, like, uh, so you're saying that maybe the like the case of the uh, um, where commuters run over black children, it's like maybe it's like a reactionary kind of position. Is, it, is that kind of what you're asking, or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think what I would say is that that um, the situatedness and the power that's explicit in that it is a kind of uh, it was meant to be uh, provocative, and I, I think it's actually it's still quite a provocative graphic. Um, and I would say that. That is um, what is important about it is, in a sense, that perspective. It like is the not is the not claim to objectivity in a sense. It's the kind of the clear statement of position, which kind of goes back to that saying that I think is maybe now out of fashion, but is that thing of like transparency is the new objectivity, <laughs> but but where we we reveal more about our own intentions and biases um, as the mechanism for kind of saying, well, he, this is me, and this is why I'm saying what I'm saying, um, rather than seeking a, an objectivity that's outside of ourselves and our bodies and our, our perspectives. Yeah. It's interesting because um, I've started be, being um, interested in this idea of disambiguation when uh, I was working on a project called Wikipedia Illustrated. And I worked with uh, uh, Galia Ofri, who, who's, uh, who's an artist, She's also my wife. 
Um, but but she, we decided to do to illustrate Wikipedia articles, to try to ask what's the what's the deal with with visual language in in Wikipedia? Why do we not see more collaboration around that? Uh, and we we had some like the whole project was framed in a very uh, naive way. Let's contribute and so on. But but it was meant uh, from a research perspective to try to hash out these. Uh, um, th these challenges and, and uh, we would uh, create these illustrations and Galia illustrates with, uh, with pens so it's not even digital illustration and the body is there, the movement of the hand is there in the image um, and when, when she would upload the, the images to Wikipedia um, they would not stay there uh, very long <laughs> and, they and then we would move them to the talk pages and try to uh, try to have the conversation there, and then uh, uh, we also had a uh, run a blog where where, where so some uh, Wikipedia editors um, commented, and they started by saying, "I am an, I am not an artist, right?" Uh, and and uh, th this position of I am I can't I can't find a way to to engage this uh, this image. Um, and, and that's a part of the collaborative problem there, because everything about Wikipedia is based on we can collaborate uh, amazingly on knowledge as long as it's through text, because because th that's where we c we can not only read but also speak. I, so I think the issue here is is uh, rhetoric. We we need to make um, data visualization uh, the. A, a much more wide, widespread rhetoric, and to understand it as rhetoric, because we don't have a problem with uh, with people making opinions and and, and expressing them, b because because they're situated in their opinions, because they're speaking them. Again, the body is there, um, and we're familiar enough with text to be critical about it, especially since we create it, can create it ourselves. So, so, I, so I think that the the point of uh, of having more tools and, uh, and to 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 um, make the conversation, the visual conversation, a part of of the deal is is where we should uh, go with this thing. Uh, thanks so much to both of you for coming and sharing this. It's really fascinating stuff, especially, I think, in um, correlation with each other. So the question I had is about, in your opinion, is there ever a moment in which the either the feminist or ethical, or maybe those are the same thing, the, the ethical feminist way to visualize data is just not to visualize the data? Either because like, there is no way to represent it in the situated form that it needs to be represented in, and there's, you're just like at an impasse about how to do that, or maybe more interestingly, because like the absence of legibility is actually kind of the ethical imperative there. Do you, do you feel like that's ever the case, or is it the, always the case that to try and make it legible to some people is, is better than just nothing? This was great. Um, this is a question just about a particular kind of tactic that I've seen that I'm sort of curious about whether you see any potential in it, which is um, games as a way of kind of troubling data visualizations. Um, the New York Times and ProPublica have been kind of doing a lot of interesting experiments with that, like transforming the actual like narratives of stories themselves through those interactions. But as a follow-up to that, there's, um, Mushan, to your point about speed, um, there's who has time to play the games, and, and I guess what are what are strategies that you have seen or that you think are effective for actually getting people to slow down to actually have that sort of engagement? Because I think the the imperative behind so much of data visualization is to mm -hmm. understand something quickly. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll try to get both questions. So so the first one, I, I think. It's it's really tricky be, because um, I, I th and and I th and I think uh, Catherine talked about it uh, as well. It's also important to un to communicate what we're not communicating. Uh, to uh, and and the problem is we can't. Uh, we do need uh, to visualize because if we want to process um, big amounts of data, um, words won't do that. Uh, even though words are much more democratic than images, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, 
um, as far as creating them um, goes, um, rather than consuming them. Um, but uh, but but the point uh, the point is I I would lean towards yes because uh, as as in try to represent the, uh, the, the data because rather than the solution in the in the Borges, uh, uh fable. Uh, where the map was completely discarded, I, I think it doesn't need to be so binary. A and, and I think we need to engage the data because we're going towards, uh, and I know you guys are working on that, on that a lot, uh, everything that has to do with, with really sophisticated algorithms that are, th that are processing a lot of data. Um, we, need, we need to be a part of that conversation. Uh, so whether we can do it with images or with text or in any other uh, other communicative uh, way, uh, we need to have that conversation. Um, now, a as to to the question about um, about ways of engaging the data, I, th I think um, I, I think there's something powerful about I don't know if it's games necessarily, but interfaces that show you how how the how the visualization would change if the values are different. Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the main examples for that is the, the Better Life Index, uh, the OECD Better Life Index, where uh, rather than tell you, telling you this is how better life looks like, th they say oh, these are a couple of parameters that we looked at. Now, uh, n now they're obviously not equal. You decide whether education is more uh, important than, than civic engagement or environment or health. And then you compare based on that. Now, now it's not like the response that you get is, this is the truth. I think the interface itself helps you um, understand that, that it's situated. It's it, it, like you need to, p to position yourself uh, to better understand uh, the data. So, so I think uh, it's not a, b a silver bullet, but 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 I def definitely think there's potential there. Yeah. So I mean, maybe I'll just I can add a concrete example for your question, Karen. Um, regarding, I definitely think that there are some times where the ethical thing to do is to not visualize or even collect data. So to be really concrete about that, uh, I was working with a, on a, a project with a woman who is a Tohono O'odham Native American who lives, like her, her backyard is the pretty new US-Mexico border fence that was built under Bush II um, that divided the Tohono O'odham community because their community straddles the border fence. And she was recounting to me that when they were building the fence, they requested that the Otom, because and the Otom tried to, I mean, they tried to prevent it. They did everything they could, but this thing was happening. Um, has caused huge, uh, like inconveniences and uh, terrible things in terms of access to services and health and so on. Um, but in any case, the the U.S. authorities asked for um, where are your burial grounds? Because one of their main arguments was saying, well, you're you're building a fence that's going directly through our secret burial grounds. Um, and they said, well, okay, well, where's your burial grounds? And then we will just like build our fence around there or whatever. Um, and the Otam said, we we cannot reveal that information. That that is sacred information. That is not. It is not. I mean, and part of the 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 code of that information is that you do not tell that information to people outside of the community. Um, and so ultimately, they did not give them that information. And they unearthed uh, Otum remains. And then they went through a process of like years to then recover them, to recover the, the bodies of their ancestors. Um, and so I mean, I think it's these cases in particular where like uh, data is not the right thing. And definitely visually, like just even the collection and the sharing of the data is not Right, the ethical thing there is to um, to, to to respect the need to um, to have a, a closed um, a closed uh, data source. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if we want to move on, but. Okay, sure. Mine's related sort of to Karen's. Um, I'm curious about cases where trying to include representations of absence of data bring up sort of the weird shadow of fragmented or decentered knowledge, which is conspiracy. 
So conspiracies mm -hmm. thrive on the absence of knowledge. Like Umberto Eco, the novelist, has a definition of a conspiracy theorist as someone whose mind works by short circuits. So when there's a short circuit, an electrical current ends up traveling along an unintended path, same way conspiracy theorists takes advantage of the absence to allow facts to intermingle when they shouldn't, and often in ways that can themselves be oppressive. So I'm just curious if there's a way to make data visu visualizations, especially once for public consumption that can sort of conf convey this con incompleteness without breeding these short circuits, or if that's even possible, or mm -hmm. if it's just inevitable that that will happen. Yeah. Put that on. Um, I'm struck by some of the resonance with things that used to be called postmodern back in the day, mm -hmm. and all that hoo-ha about how you can't dismantle the master's house for the master's tools and the politics of representation, and it's just fascinating to see it in this new, in this new angle, in this new environment, and, and I wish you more power to you, and I hope we don't end up with more identity politics, and I don't know. I guess I do have a question, like how, how will we end up, because postmodernism, we don't talk about it anymore that much, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering in this new context what's going to happen. I read two two things. So, uh, firstly, I really like the idea of thinking about feminist data all along the data pipeline. And actually, when I read your post, I like started drawing out the school, like the data pipeline, and thinking about different ways. And that's something that's really interesting to me. And the second one is about. I mean, you, work, you said you work with journalists, and so I've been working on this project called Responsible Data Reflection Stories, looking at challenges that um, people working in advocacy and journalism have had when they're working with increasing amounts of data. And one thing that's become very clear to me is like journalists don't like accepting and embracing uncertainty when they're trying to tell a story and mm -hmm. the kind of pushback that they've got or the pushback that they're giving is like oh you know I need to tell the story I don't care if it's not completely right it's like important that the story gets out there um, and I wonder what the kind of pushback is or whether you're kind of seeing that when you're teaching journalists like I mean I completely agree and like kind of they should show the uncertainty and show that they're not sure mm -hmm. um, but I'm getting so much pushback around on those kinds of lines that's, that's really interesting Francesca. Thank you. Uh, so I look at data more, data visualization, like organization of information in terms of news feeds. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding in things like Facebook and Twitter and Yik Yak is they're trending us towards popular versus unpopular, mm -hmm. things that are downvoted or flagged. And I've been desperately trying to get access to this deleted content so I can make mm -hmm. visible what you're saying, mm -hmm. these stories and perspectives, mm -hmm. and barred by you know um, mm -hmm. proprietary and so I'm just wondering if you have thought about how can we get past those hurdles of when the data is not owned by us, right. but um, it's only one perspective is being shown with that data. Yeah. And Matt has the last word. Uh, first, Noel and I were just talking about the West Wing map clip yeah. before the talk, so that <laughs> so was great, thanks. More for Catherine. Uh, you made me think that maybe the problems with visualizations are the same ones we've been having with statistics and numbers. And mm -hmm. I think there's a book mm -hmm. called Trust in Numbers. Mm -hmm. But much, much worse because the potential audience is so much mm -hmm. larger. We didn't yeah. evolve with written language. We evolved seeing things. Yeah. The New York Times has a data visualization group. They don't have an equation presentation group. Right. <laughs> so do you feel that maybe some of the problems are the same, but it's on the, on the front end, it's worse because we feel maybe everyone can understand a visualization, whereas when we just had equations, only a select few could. Because you've, you've left me kind of horrified yeah. by this possibility. <laughs> Thanks. Great. So um, on that horrified note. Oh yeah, on the horrification. <laughs> so on that note, um, Michonne and Catherine are actually going to stick around so um, to continue this conversation. But our time here has come to a close. And so please join me in um, thanking uh, Michonne and Catherine. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.